Rob. Hi, Tim. Well, I'm trying to figure out how I can um, turn my camera around. There it is. Oh my God, stand back. <laughs> Here we are live, uh, IGTV, it's amazing. It's so good to see you, dude. I like I like your furry your furry countenance, man. I want to hug you. Oh yeah, wild and woolly version of Mozart currently. It looks very soft. Soft. Yeah. <laughs> soft and furry and cuddly. <laughs> good, I guess. I think that's a good thing. How are you doing? I'm good. It's 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 cold. Uh, maybe a little flurryish in Cincinnati, Ohio. Wow. I'm in the yeah. second second floor of our house and I've got big windows in my little home studio. And uh, yesterday the snowflakes were falling. They were as big as baby's fists. <laughs> they look like big tulip petals or something. Uh, they were just giant. Did you get the, uh, do you have a few inches on the ground or what, what happened? No, no, uh, a little dusting here and there. Yeah, we got a couple inches here in Philly and New York. I think got about, I don't know, 10, 10, 12. Yeah. So, you know, snow days, so to speak. So yeah. how have you been doing in um, these unprecedented times that we're living in as musicians and as people? And we are all feeling this around the world at the same time. It's a universal feeling. Yeah, um, uh, the there's big really not, I don't know if there's a lot of comfort in, in knowing everyone else is, is going through the same thing. I mean, for me, it's been a roller coaster ride and it's every day. Yeah. Uh, the, I, I, I've, I've been taught and I, and I believe that there's a beginning and a middle and an end to everything I experience, we experience. So when I'm, uh, you know, just really bumming out, I sometimes when it's at its worst, I, I, something in me triggers the thought that, oh, it's, it, this is the worst part. So that means I'm halfway through, which means I'm halfway through. <laughs> uh, and I, I'm, just, I, I'm just resorting to different ways to keep my serotonin and dopamine levels up. Running, walking, getting outside is huge. You know, I was, I was thinking about it today while I was running. It, running's like, a, you know, it's a happy drug for me. Um, yeah. I'm not sure working and making music is such a happy thing, but it's, it's, where, it's where, I guess, in my area of the arts, it's where you can turn the pain into something beautiful. You know. you, you've, been, you've been, of course, uh, writing uh, for decades and have written so many songs and put out so many albums with you know uh, a, a large number of your bands going back to when I first met you was the Raisins and uh, Spike Dots, the Bears and Rob Fetter's solo work and um, you know you've had you know all this time quite a practice I mean you've been infatuated with music I guess and um, you've held you've held the line what it what is it that is um um what is it that inspires you to keep keep going well let's let's start with the, the you know the 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 base fact the cruel fact is that i don't know how to do anything else <laughs> yeah. i mean nobody's going to pay me to run for them or anything um, I, I I don't know. I mean, I'm always, I mean, every day I feel like I'm starting over a yeah. lot of, and, uh, and it's, especially technologically speaking, if I if I step away from a digital audio workstation too long, I I'm learning it all over again. It comes quicker than the first time, and technology is moving so fast. It it doesn't really matter when you get on the merry-go-round. You just pick up where you are. That's why I, I tell people that they haven't even touched digital technology or anything don't worry about it we're all we're all newbies um yeah and uh don't be afraid of it that way 
I, I don't know what, what inspires me. I, I, I hate to say it, but I, I think pain, you know, discomfort, the itch uh, makes me want to scratch it. And that's what I do. But, you know, this is a two way conversation. And, and I, I want to I want to call you on some stuff. Oh, because you're because, Tim, you do some stuff that I don't do. And um, and and it's just the idea of of going cold into a room, getting your equipment ready, you know, getting 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 the tools ready to go, and then just picking up a guitar and making a record <laughs> <laughs> by yourself or with friends, and and getting it done in a in a couple of days or, or three days. Uh, I I get ten songs done that I'm willing to share with the world in like three years. So you work w way faster than me and the quality is still really high and there. How, how do you do that? I'm not sure, you know, it's a different process, but I love this, I love this topic and I would love for us to stay in this area for a while if we can, because it's, it's really interesting. Like uh, what I do, um, I think it goes, you know, I've been having a number of epiphanies this week and, um, and one of the things was uh, kind of related to this question is how did, how did, where did this come from? And I think going all the way back to when I was a kid and my mom playing Miles Davis, so what for me one day when I was, I don't know how old I was, nine or 10. And I was like, how do they do that? Um, that's where it started, I think, you know? And um, so my quest became, how do I do that? And um, so I started learning about jazz and learning how to play scales and all that stuff, which we all do uh, over jazz changes and stuff. But eventually I started listening to records where these guys are improvising. Um, how do they do that? So, you know, it started there, I think. And um, I started playing with some real masters here in Philadelphia that would kick my ass. I go on stage and there's no no charts, there's nothing, then you have your ears and um, you do what you can do. And so that's kind of how it started for me, you know, um, playing on stages here and and listening to so much of that kind of music, like listen to, you know, Miles' 70s era, you know, where a lot of that stuff is, um, maybe there's a riff or a theme, but it, it's totally free improv, really, you know, and um, listening to artists like that, you know, and, and you eventually get to players like Cecil Taylor or something, you're like, what is going on, you know? So it's this huge world that I kind of dove in. It's like an ocean really, and try to swim around in there and find out what's going on. And I think um, when you improvise, um, it's not really a comfortable place I've found to be, you know? It's like, it's very difficult because you're in the microsecond all the time just trying to get to something and if you're playing by yourself that's one thing but if you're with two two or three other musicians you know at least you're you know in the ocean with three other people or something and you're throwing the ball around back and forth to one another and so it's it's something like that you get in there and you just start trying um and uh you let the music flow and you let it open up and see see what starts to materialize out of like a little idea and um you know it's something like that rob you know do, do you do you when you're in the middle of it, do you find the the what i i think the reason i'm afraid to do it is that i would fall back on familiar things you know comfortable yeah. positions just things i do automatically if i pick up a guitar it, it's it's i I'll, I'll play the same patterns you know just yeah. that who knows thinking about I need a cup of coffee or not, you know? Yeah. Uh, and I, I fall back to those things. And then, and then I immediately feel like, well, I'm cheating. I'm not, this isn't, this isn't something new. This is something I did three months ago, you know? Yeah. It's kind of, how do you self-sabotage, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, get in these places. And there's a lot of fear there. Uh, I think, you know, like if you're in front of an audience and like you, there's no music, there's no tune. You're, you're walking out on stage and um, quite often you're lost. I feel lost. And then you find, find yourself, you find, you find your feet. 
but I think you have to get lost for a while. Like, you know, sometimes I'll rely on, you know, we know what we know, so we can always rely on that stuff. But it's like when you start throwing your fingers down on the fretboard and you don't know what's going to happen necessarily, you know, and uh, as the sparks are flying, you know, something might start to crystallize. And it's, it's a process that seems like when you're in it, it seems like forever, you know, that's how deep in it you are. But then it starts opening up, you know, and I never have an, any idea what happened when I'm done playing. Yeah. Like after an hour, I don't know what happened. You know, well, when you, so you, you mentioned, oh, excuse me, you mentioned ocean and I immediately thought of a, a friend of mine who's a really good sailor. <laughs> and he's got a nice sailboat he's, and he knows what he's doing. And he goes to the same little body of water, uh, you know, little Traverse Bay. And it's, and it's, I mean, it's, it's that bay. I mean, he's going to go point X to point Z or whatever. Yeah. Uh, every day. And on one hand, I think, well, wouldn't it be nice, to, wouldn't it be a little more variety to go out in Lake Michigan or something like that? But then after I sailed with him for a while, I realized every day out there is different. You know, the yeah. conditions are different. The band you're playing with is different. The vibes are different. Uh, it's daytime, it's nighttime, whatever. Um, so he really is doing something and improvising accordingly to the wind. I mean, all these things he has yeah. no control over, you know, how to work within it. And, and, and that's when I realized why it was so much fun to go sailing on the same boat, same body of water, same captain of the ship, whatever, <laughs> uh, and, and just go along with it. And, you know, I, you know, talking about this, I, 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 I there's some other people uh, listening to us talk that the thing that I'm acutely aware of is that I, I think in every walk of life, everybody does that, you know, a plumber. I, yeah. When Dave, when Dave, our plumber, comes into our house, he's <laughs> he's improvising. You know, he's looking at this old house and trying to figure you know, it out. Yeah, he's trying to figure it out. He's looking at us. He likes us, so he doesn't want to rip us off. You know, um, we like him. Uh, and we talk guitars while he's working, and I'm watching him plumb because um, <laughs> he, he's got a nice co collection. Because he's a plumber, he can afford it. Um, right. But it's the same thing, uh, you know, creating and recreating as we go. And I, and thinking about, you know, what we're going to talk about. We're improvising. Yeah, we're, we're improvising. And yet I like this form of music that is, you know, for like three minute pop songs. Uh, yeah. uh, the highfalutin way to say it is maybe I'm a miniaturist. A miniature of art rock or something, but yeah, and there's there's a lot of infinity in all those songs too, you know. Yeah, it's, and it could still go anywhere, and even yeah. when I'm trying to play them, I'm every day, every time it's a different it's it's a different challenge, you know. Where's my voice tonight? Yeah, or or and the challenge of screwing up and uh, everything going slow mo. Yeah. You know, for me, you know, if I watch it later, it's like, God, that was just half a second. Nobody even caught it. But oh, to yeah. me, it was like. <laughs> exactly. And yeah. That, that happens in those moments where it's out of control. You know? uh -huh. And I just, I just, uh, I thrive on that. I thrive on not knowing what's going to happen. But man, it's dangerous, you know, you know, it's dangerous stuff. But yeah. um, on the flip side of that, just like you, I love I love the three minute song, too. I love great songs. And, you know, I, I feel like in this process of improvising live in front of people versus being in the studio and, um, you know, you're writing songs or you're writing songs on your couch. That's a form of improvisation, too. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like you're, you're sitting on the couch and where do, where, does, where does the chord progression come from? You know, where does, uh, where, is there a lyric spark? I mean, is that, you know, with you, I mean, are you plugging into, you know, some form of the universe at that moment or is it stuff that you're thinking about at the time? I, 
I, I, this is this is uh, this is fun. Now I'm re I'm re I, I shouldn't be reading, <laughs> reading while I'm listening. So um, let's talk about painting. Okay. You do have a painting, and I saw you posing with it today, and I want that painting. <laughs> uh, but actually, I just like looking at it. I don't I don't need to own it. So uh, <laughs> maybe maybe somebody with some big deep pockets can can buy it from you. How does how does how does that work for you? My mom was an artist. I have, I have a sister that's a really good artist. Um, I can I can draw a, a childlike picture of a baby bird, and I can do Skelly. You know, um, you're definitely an artist. Well, yeah, but I'm not really a graphic artist, so it's you know I I, I am not a graphic artist like you are, and or my mom or my sister or, or, or artists. How does it uh, how does it work for you? I mean, when do when do you put down the guitar and pick up the paintbrush? Is 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 that a is there is it like a different day? Is it a different feeling, or is it the same same kind of muse coming at you? Yeah, it's the same kind of muse. It's it's um, the same feeling that I get from playing music, and it started a long time ago when I would. Uh, come back from a tour. Well, actually it started before that. My neighbor gave me all his paints one day and this was like back in the nineties and he was going to become a digital artist. He didn't want to work with paint anymore. So one day he gave me a box of paints and I'm like, wow, this is amazing. And uh, one day, you know, I started painting and one day I really zoned into it and I got it. I, I got to that same feeling that I do when I'm playing music. And, and when I was done, there was this painting. And um, I think it's, uh, you know, definitely the same, the same vibe for me, you know, music to art, music to painting, music to photography, you know, where you fall into a zone. I get into this deep zone and it's like, um, I have to do it. And as far as when it happens, it could be, you know, I go through phases, like I go through studio phases coming down here to work, like, and songs are coming out, music's coming out or I'll go upstairs in the garage and feel like I need to play with color for the evening. And then when I'm done, I feel a lot better, like it's necessary to do it. Yeah. You know? You know, you spoke about your mom. I don't know if everybody knows about your mom. Why don't you tell us about your mom? Because your mom, my mom was not a professional musician. <clears throat> she was a, a commercial artist for a while before she got married and, and then painted on the side. Uh, but I, we both had moms that I'm sure probably told us when we were creating total pieces of crap, age six, that's wonderful. <laughs> that's great. I, I know you had that kind of mom. I did too, you know, our first fan. But let us know about your mom. Well, my mom, wow, she was a queen, you know, she, um, she uh, was a singer, a big band singer in 1939, 1940, right around that area when she was 20, 21, 22. And um, she had an opportunity at that time to, to go to New York with a big band from, I think it was from Cincinnati. Um, and I couldn't tell you the name of it, my, my sister could, but, um, and they were gonna play live on CBS radio which was like the big time then, you know? And my grandmother told my mom, you're not gonna go out on the road with that big band. And if you do, don't ever come back. Ooh. So my, my mom stayed, she didn't go. And um, the band leader had to find someone to take her, part, to take her place and um, auditioned all these singers and found this woman named Doris in somewhere in Cincinnati, and that was Doris Day, changed her last name to Day. And she went and did the gig. And uh, the rest is kind of like really interesting history. But so that's my mom and she didn't get to kind of follow her dreams in a way. I think it's kind of stopped there and she always played the piano and ended up having a family and all that stuff. But she was always um, supporting um, her kids with music. 
And with me, she saw that I was, you know, just infatuated with music and guitar and stuff. So she was just always there, you know, um, you know, having my back all the time. And, 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 you know, I thought all moms were like, like her. She'd be making meatloaf in the kitchen and saying, you know, why don't you learn that one? You know, and she'd sing it. And I thought all moms did that shit. So that was uh, part of my education. But she, she always had a twinkle in her you know, she always knew that there was some kind of um, thing going on with she 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 kept uh, kept the flame alive you know even though my dad's like get a real job <laughs> yeah this is part of our friendship yeah. I know because that, that, that's where we really connect my my mom could whip out stardust on her upright piano <laughs> uh, wow uh, yeah just out of nowhere you know, she just start playing it, uh, but but it was the same thing. Uh, you know, yeah. I, I try to be playing. I try to play along with. You know, I can see for miles, and I, I wasn't getting it right. I could. I was working on that guitar solo. You know, the greatest guitar <laughs> solo ever played. Um, one note. <laughs> um, and she just said, oh, it's, you sound just like the record. I, I'm sure I didn't, but, but that's what I needed. I needed to hear that. So, oh, I yeah. can do this. And uh, then eventually I found out I could never play like any of the records. So I had to make up my own way because <laughs> I could play like that. Yeah, so, yeah. So, it worked. Okay. Um, so uh, I, I, we're going to spend, I don't know what our time is here. How are you surviving? How is how is 2020? Um, first of all, everybody was. It's nice. Every musician, everybody in in the in music business, uh, any the entertainment field that I know. Uh, everything changed. It started changing mid March. By the end of March, certainly by tax day, April 15th, we all knew. We were sunk, and everyone we knew was sunk. Um, yeah. What'd you start doing then? What was, what was going on? Well, um, uh, at the top of January, things were going really well. A new yeah. album came out with this band that I'm in called Band at 65. And we played a sold out show here in Philly and our record just got reviewed in downbeat with five stars. And it was like, you know, we're looking at tour dates. Uh, things were rolling that way and then this came this came down and you know in march and suddenly there was nothing so it stopped for everybody you know and, and i remember that period in time because we were all calling everyone like what's going on what's going to happen and um, we had to fix everything you know like if we have houses or apartments like how do we how do we continue? You know, how do we pay the rent if there's no money coming in? And, you know, some of us have uh, been very ingenious and, and done some stuff like you and, and started, you know, uh, your Rob TV show, which I love, which I want you um, As for me, you know, I, I, um, I took to the studio for a while and was just writing and stuff like that. And thankfully, um, the university where I teach university arts uh, stayed open, but remotely. So all the students were online. And um, because I had all this connection, con connectivity downstairs in the studio, I could, I could do music here and work with dancers. So that kind of ended up being a lifeline, you know, and, um, and then there's just all these angels out there who are fans who are buying CDs and things like that. Um, keeping me afloat that way. So, you know, it's so a lot of those kinds of things were going on, you know, and, um, and we're still, we're still um, going downstream right now, trying to figure it out daily, as you said earlier, you know, and, and tell, tell us what you were doing. You know, yeah. it's like, yeah, the feeling of like, you know, the abyss is 10 days away has never left me, but that's been pretty much the story of my adult life. <laughs> As a, as a musician, you know, maybe, maybe you, you get a tour that's I'm cool for the next six weeks or things like that. And even in commercial music, it's the same thing. Yeah, uh, they're, they're, 
spells of, of just nonstop work, um, sometimes for months at a time, every day, uh, 12 hour days, and then it stops. Um, so in that sense, when everything stopped for me, I, I, uh, my initial reaction was, well, I've been here before. I'm not, we're, we're, we're going to be able to pay the bills for a little while. Yeah. Um, but then as it dawned on me, and, and really the person that opened my eyes was my son, Noah, because Noah, um, uh, who's uh, 26, is a, um, he's a drummer. If, uh, oh, by the way, we're supposed, to, we're supposed to boost our own careers and stuff. If anybody's interested in mine, go to robfetters.net. You can watch videos for free. You can see links to everything I do for free. Um, and if you happen to be wealthy or something like that, there are ways you can support me and you can figure that out, but it's free and enjoy. Um, but uh, anyway, my, back to my son. <laughs> that's, all the, that's all the self, for some reason, boosting my career feels like self-flagellation. I don't know, it's, it's bad. Um, it's something to do with being raised a Methodist, I think. Um, I am not, I am a recovered Methodist. Uh, <laughs> But anyways, Noah um, works uh, for staging and, and, and lights and, and audio for, for a, a big company um, based in Cincinnati. And, and summer, spring, summer, fall is just when all the shows are. And, and this year, was, I was really excited for him. He was excited, too, because he, things had stepped up. And um, uh, he even was going to work a stage at Bonnaroo this year. And... You know, I was just thinking, do yeah. it. When you're a dad, you, you, you want your kids to be able to work at what they like to do. And uh, and he called me, you know, one week and said, uh, you know, things are canceled for like 30 days. And then the next week it was the summer's gone. Yeah. And, and that was the summer's gone. I mean, we can't even go outside. We can't even socially, you know, can't stay six feet apart and see the Rolling Stones or whatever, you know? Nope. Um, and so that's when it got through my thick head uh, that we were in trouble. And um, people had, I, I don't have a lot of fans, but I have the world's greatest fans. <laughs> and they're, they're yeah. spread out far and wide. Um, and they've, I've been told a lot, why don't you do a, a, a live stream show? And I just never wanted to. Um, yeah. I, I didn't, it just didn't sound like fun um, to me. But Noah, no one thought he could figure out how we could do a, a quality live stream. And, um, you know, so it's often the case, and I've told some people that uh, people have come to me for some reason, like I'm a like I'm the, a minister or a consular or something, and I, <laughs> I, I don't have any secrets of the universe, but I do know that when I'm feeling really shitty about something, can we say shitty on Instagram? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, when I'm feeling really depressed mm. about my lot in life the best way to get out of that is to find somebody that feels even worse than me, you know, um, throw somebody else a life vest. And then there's two of us. And uh, Noah really, what he was not complaining or whining or anything, but I was worried about him. And yeah. so I decided I was going to try to do a live stream really just so I could keep Noah busy and we could keep, keep happy and that's when things started clicking and i and i discovered that yeah. the last couple of years where i you know had, had learned how to do uh house concerts which yeah. five years ago i was way too terrified to do i mean i I've, i want to have a big loud drummer like chris arducer or somebody pounding next to me covering up my mistakes <laughs> now, a couple other guys to sing with me or you know yeah um the comfort of a band. Oh, the comfort of a band is so is so great. But I I started doing the the house concerts and as as some of you know, I the last thing on earth I wanted to do was play all my stuff unplugged. That was, that was not going to happen. You know, I'll say it right now. Unplugged died for me the night I heard Eric Clapton play Layla on acoustic guitars. <laughs> you know, 
I'm old enough. I saw Jarek and the Dominoes play Layla in wow. Detroit, Town Theater. Wow. And they're, I don't know where they play a dozen times in the U.S., but I saw one of those concerts. And, you know, I just, I, I like electric. I, I love acoustic guitars. I, yeah. But I don't like me on acoustic guitar more than like one or maybe two songs. Then it's time to pick up an electric guitar and play. Um, so I figured out how to do that with tracks at the house concerts by um, remixing album cuts and everything, kind of Rob karaoke. Yeah. So I did that across the country uh, for a couple, uh, almost two years, and then got hit with this. And I and then it was like, duh, I could do this in my studio. Yeah. So, thing and then i just put on my clown hat because i'm a clown and figured out <laughs> <laughs> these live streams and at first i was terrified and and then uh it turned it, it went from terror to just a critical case of embarrassment at the end of every live stream yeah all i all i hear are my mistakes and you know i hear them in slow motion i see them in slow motion you know i hit a hit a, a note wrong sing something wrong or forget the words uh and die a thousand deaths in a, a nanosecond um and then i just got over it i got over me you know yeah give myself a break. I'd give anybody else a break, but I won't give myself a break. And I finally started giving myself a break toward the end of season one and really started having fun. And uh, so it worked. And I, I, so I'm a lucky one. And again, yeah. you know, I, I also decided I can't charge people. I mean, the only, I figured the only people watching this stuff are going to be other musicians. They don't have any money. We none of us are working. <laughs> um, uh, but then it was strongly suggested that I put a PayPal, set up a PayPal button and Venmo button. And, and I simply said, you know, if you can be a patron of the arts, <laughs> right. whatever you call what I do, um, go ahead. And it turned out enough people did that. And they, and they, they kept it afloat. And it was, That's a blessing. Yeah. You know, Noah got paid. Uh, uh, Russo, who helped with the lights and get, got stuff together, because I'm in here by myself, but they set me up and a lot of FaceTime phone calls saying, plug it in there, dummy. <laughs> and I, I got that kind of stuff together and it, it works. I've been uh, just, you know, as you probably have too, I've been just checking out the internet and seeing what people are doing. And, um, you know, it, it's a wild time, you know, everybody wants live music everybody needs music in their life because it's very healing it just makes us feel better and especially when we're playing it um the the world is a better place in those days and and the fact the fact that you figured that out and went for it and have like a series now it's like how how many episodes have you done uh we did 23 and 20 and, and season 23 uh and uh, season three starts, I, I think maybe January 9th. It might be the following. I mean, I'm aiming for the ninth because I figure by January 9th, everybody's going to be really, yeah, really depressed. And people can find that just by going to robfetters.net, right? Thanks for the plug. You know how to plug. <laughs> Is that what that was? A plug? Yeah. Thank you. And also, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm looking at my notes here. Robfetters.bandcamp.com is another another place that people can go. And I know you have a new album that you released during this period of time. I did. Uh, Ship Shake. Ship. Ship Shake. Yeah. Tell me about that record. <laughs> well, um, the first song on it uh, turned this ship around. Um, I actually wrote most of the about all the words and the and the guts of it in uh, 2009 when I had a, a year of non-compete from a studio I worked at <laughs> like that was an interesting survival story there and uh, I, I don't think anybody I, I don't know I, the rest of the world didn't relate to it because their world wasn't blowing up and I, I didn't I didn't release it on my last record but 
um, uh, early this year, I, I, I was just going through old files and I found it and uh, suddenly it made a whole lot of sense. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so I finished that and I had Adrian um, sing a harmony on it. So it's about as close to the Bears as you're going to get this year. Um, That's great. I'm always trying to re. I, I, I do. I don't try. I do reunite the Bears somehow, some way, as often as I can. Um, uh, I'm like ring, the Ringo or, or something. You know, they'll come on. Will you <laughs> sing it? Yeah, okay, I'll do it. You know. Uh, That's great. But, but uh, the other songs. I mean, some of them are are are, are fairly old. Um, the album ends with Shaken Street. Ship Shake and Swish Shake and Street, and I didn't write that one. That's an MC5 song, and I, I grew up uh, worshiping the MC5. Saw them play in Detroit a lot when I was way too young to go to those shows. Um, uh, but the big last kids in high we, school. Uh, we talked. Yeah. A bit. I'm, I'm sorry. Last night we were talking a little bit about that era of your life, and um, it kind of blew my mind because uh, you were telling me some of the earliest shows that you saw. And, uh, um, you know, that that era, you know, you saw Hendrix, that was your first concert. I saw yeah. Hendrix with a Goldwater Republican dad. <laughs> My dad took me to see Jimi Hendrix. It's a Jimi Hendrix experience. Dude, that's yeah. insane. Yeah, the opener was Soft Machine. I mean, you know, Hearing that last night, I was just like, it was an inevitable that you would become who you are. I, just from was, that, yeah, there, that singular show, that had to be the blow. Yeah. Yeah, eventually I had to get a Stratocaster. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I'm, I, my parents, I had great parents. My parents- You had to get uh, a Strat. Shows, and then when I, I started, you know, I was a little hotshot blues guitar player like everybody else in Sylvania, Ohio. Um, I think, I mean, everybody. <laughs> are. I mean, you played in a band. We all played in bands. And, uh, um, but I, I played with uh, guys that were older than me. It was always, as, as you said at the beginning of this, it's really a good idea to play with people that know a whole lot more than you. So <laughs> somehow I got to play with the big kids. Yeah. The big kids had cars. And the big kids could uh, BS my parents into, into thinking they were going to take care of Robbie <laughs> at the show at, in Detroit. You know, and the, 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 the concert halls in Detroit were like the equivalent of like the Fillmore's, you know, the Avalon ball, ballrooms. Um, what was it? Uh, Electric, Electric Circus in Philadelphia? Yeah. yeah. Um, Electric Factory. Electric Factory. Yeah. yeah. Not um, and... Uh, so I got to see I got to see everybody. I mean, I I, I saw Janis Joplin when I was fourteen. Wow! I you touched see, Janis Joplin when I was fourteen. You really saw like the first wave, you know, the very yeah. first wave, of the coolest stuff that, that came through the U.S. Yeah. Um, Mind expanding. I, I, I saw Iron Butterfly. <laughs> <laughs> but the, what was cool, the thing that the thing that I eventually did, I, I got comfortable going to all these shows and being around Detroit um, was was interesting because that's what I saw bands go from playing to 15 or 20 people throwing things at them to getting record deals and getting famous. You know, that the Stooges, <laughs> you know, I saw Iggy a bunch of times. Um, uh um and yeah. uh, he never finished the show without getting hurt or without a guitar, a, a beautiful Rick and Becker 360 just getting smashed. Oh, what'd you do that to that guitar for? You know, um, but I saw that and I, and I saw the MC5 a bunch of times and I, I love the MC5. Wow. And um, so, you know, just, just curving that on back to where we are now with your, your new album you know, uh, ship shake and where we are and, and kind of kind of thinking about the background, you know, it, it's really interesting, you know, how, um, you know, I've been thinking about this this week, too, because I had this interview that I had to write and this essay I had to write and, um, you know, trying to think about the first album that really rattled me, 
And it was like, wow, what is that? You know, and had to go way back to Mary Lou's, my, my oldest sister's record collection. And she had all the Beatles and it was meant to her. I finally figured out yeah. that that would be the record that blew my mind out as a seven year old sitting there looking at the, the booklet and the cartoons and listening to I Am the Walrus and Strawberry Fields Forever and thinking about the coda of Strawberry Fields where Ringo's, cat, you know, and he's, you know, it's like sitting there going, what is this as a seven-year-old? So you had those kinds of epiphanies too at that time. And, you know, you know we had no, no chance not to do music. We had to do it. There was, I think there's listeners and then there's, um, there's people that love to listen to music, but then for us, it was like, how do you do that? Maybe, you know, I want to be. It's, it's funny. I, I've I done is nothing I have ever done is really original. And I, I realized like, you know, like I, I have, I have maybe, I have several songs that have this, like, I'm going to do this no matter what. And ship shake is actually, there are songs that are, we're turning the ship around. You know? Yeah. It's not the end of the world. Yeah. Um, Go all the way with it. You know, there's uh, the song called Dog is God. I'm uh, quoting Ernest Hemingway and um, Vincent Van Gogh, you know, and, but I'm, I'm thinking I just about drove my dad batshit crazy because every morning of ninth grade, I played If Six Was Nine, the last song before I left for school, <laughs> you know, and that was Jimmy saying the same thing, you know. You can't dress like me. You can't do anything. You know, <laughs> I'm going this way. You're going that yeah. way. I'm going this way. And nothing's yeah. going to stop. That's how we were raised. And yeah. it was just I, right or wrong. <laughs> All I know is we survived. I mean, we've got, I've got more white hair than you, but, you know, you've got a nice white beard there and you're still a musician. We're still doing yeah. it. Yeah. We're still doing it. And uh, there's nothing else I'd rather be doing. You know, it's like I'm still so in love with music and creating music, you know, and um, I can't wait to the next thing. You know, I can't wait to release the next album and uh, whatever it is. And, and I really look forward to playing with bands again, you know, in a yeah. band. I think it's I think it's neat. Um, you know, one of the setups for the, the isolation is I mean, I, I know I, there are probably a lot of prog rock music lovers watching this and everything. And you you may disagree, but I personally think Billie Eilish is really great and her brother. And, I, I, you know, I think about those those two, you know, a brother and a sister homeschooled. You, you, you may know their story. I, there's probably myth. And I know they're Billy is huge now, but, um, you know, a few years ago when I first started hearing about her, I kind of knew the story and it was, and it was, they're making these cool records in a bedroom. Right. You know? And, uh, and, uh, you know, I, I know a lot of, I work with a lot of mu young musicians that get Ableton, you know, get maybe some free software and put some stuff together. And I've heard some really cool stuff, but yeah. whatever hearing from from billy you know was first of all a really strong great personality you know you know i don't have to be your kind of chick i, I just love you know it, it's like i don't know i mean feminism won with with billy eilish and she's her own young woman now but i mean when i when i first started heard her i think maybe she was 16 or something you know mm. um Noah was the one that turned me on to Billy. Um, right. Yeah. But uh, but but what I heard and what was so exciting to me was, I heard a vocal sound I had never heard before. I mean, I couldn't figure out how she was getting that sound. Wow. I mean, it almost sounded like it's the microphone in her mouth. But then, how is she enunciating? Uh, enunciating because it was so could understand every word. Um, and. It was in tune and I don't think it was severely auto-tuned or anything. She's, you know, she can, the chick can sing and she was doing something differently. And I, and I always thought like the, you know, close mic'd 
vocal sounds, that hyper-realism I've always loved, you know, uh, Black yeah. by the Beatles for us old guys, that's like, that's called hyper-real, you know. <laughs> you could sit in a room with Paul McCartney, it's not going to sound like that. It only sounds like that if you're, you know, mic'd that close and everything's yeah. kind of, you know, focused in in that way, in an audio sense. Yeah. And she was doing it in a different way. And, and uh, I think that's, that's what, you know, old farts like us need to, to, to pay attention to. Um, I mean, we obviously know how the Beatles did it because it is so well documented. And this is where you put the mic and this is the guitar you play. Overly the, documented. What? Uh, by, Overly by documented. The, yeah. Um, I mean, we, we know everything about the Beatles, you know. Um, and and uh, they were recorded very well. And, uh, I'm not. I love the way the Beatles were recorded, and and I have learned a lot of that. But um, I get really excited when I can learn from a 16 year old girl that recorded Absolutely. only in the bedroom, you know. And well, and one thing that, that to me is one more thing exciting. Thing, I'm sorry. Um, go ahead. I'm, I'm done. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, one thing I wanted to say is like, w we're all bedroom musicians now. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, everybody has a laptop. And um, it's so interesting to to hear what is coming out, you know, and 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 uh, people not knowing how to play instruments great, or even knowing how to engineer, they're coming up with they're they're figuring it out, they're figuring out new ways of doing things. And that is very inspiring, you know, and, and um, you know, quite often like uh, creative people are very insecure, you know, and it's like, oh, I'm not good enough yet. I need to be better. Or, this song is not, doesn't sound as good as it, as it should. And, you know, hats off to people that just say, fuck it. I'm going to, you know, make this thing and this is my thing and I'm going to get it done, you know. And, th and there's a lot of that happening right now. I, I like, I like seeing that for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's cool. Yeah, I know. I know so many people. Uh, you know, there were a lot of guys that played guitar like I did in high school, and then they put the guitars down, or you know, right. I don't know. Became art directors <laughs> at ad agencies or insurance salesmen or whatever, and now they're picking it up again. That's and, good. I mean, every one of them. They, they. I just say, God, what a great time to to enter this world of technology. Yeah. Uh, it is it's it is totally egalitarian uh if you if you've got lots of money and lots of experience that probably means you've got too much software and too many instruments and which one are you going to pick up you, you get lost at some point yeah you know it's it's a really good idea to simplify and just get the ideas out but uh, i i've got some some friends that are you know in their 60s that are just recording th these songs that they've had for a long time i think you know, oh, cool. And, and they're recording them at home and I'm afraid to play it. I said, just send me the MP3, you know, just to let me hear it. And <laughs> it's, I'm not, you know, it's like, God, I didn't know you had a great voice because they never sang it's before. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Just get it out yeah. there. I, 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 would, it. I would encourage everybody to do it. And I, I should probably encourage myself to paint. But. So you far, know, this is a time where I think it's, it's um, you know, creativity is about, you know, doing, you know, it's not about anything except that. And once we start doing anything, whatever it is we want to do, then we're going to start making stuff. And we're going to, I think that's the, the thing that I keep finding are out about improv, improvisational music is that if I wouldn't have jumped off the cliff and tried to do this stuff, I wouldn't have advanced or found this really cool music that shows up when you're improvising, you know, and it's, it's the same way of just by starting doing. And if you can do that practice every day, who knows what's going to happen, you know, but it comes back to you starting Rob TV, you know, that's what I call it anyway, yeah. Rob TV. When you started it, you did it, started doing it. And that's why it became what it is. And now you're 23 episodes in and who knows all the epiphanies and insight you got from doing that, you know? So it's a beautiful thing.
And that's what we have to do as creatives. You know, we just have to believe and say what the fuck and do it. Yeah. And you did. And, and because how else are you going to learn? I mean, and the thing is, I, you know, I didn't do Rob TV myself. I, Noah was huge. A friend of mine named Gordon was all right. instrumental. I mean, I, there's some technical help there. We had a, we had a team there. You know, they, yeah. And they, they understand yeah. my severe weaknesses. <laughs> I'm really not sure what electricity is, to tell you the truth. Uh, I, I know it can hurt if you stick your finger in the wrong hole and stuff like that. But um, uh, yeah, but I mean, how else would I have known that my son Noah, who I knew was a good drummer, was a, is actually like a great drummer and can record himself, you know, in a warehouse and, and send me tracks and... and uh, a lot of the, the music, I, I haven't had the album tracks or I haven't been able to get it right, so I re-record them and, and now we're at a point where, I mean, this is fantastic that That's awesome. I can call several drummers. Yeah. Wh whoever wants, you know, that day, who wants to do it the most, you know, and they'll go, yeah, I can have your tracks tonight. Bob Nicewanger, you know, um, same thing. Matt Malley, my friend in uh, um, Moore Park, California. Uh, they just, uh, I, I send them tracks and 24 hours later, I just get these exquisitely recorded, perfect tracks with the, with the guys going, hey, if there's anything you don't like, Rob, I'll do it again. You know, it's like, are you kidding me? It's perfect. Yeah. <laughs> Please don't, do not do it again. You got it right the first time. Yeah. Exactly. We need to forget and, about. 30 years ago, we had to go in big ass studios and pay a lot of money. And I miss the yeah. engineer part of that. I miss working with engineers, you know, guys that are trained and, and know through the countless hours experience how to record. Yes. Those, those guys are, uh, I'll, I'll never be that good. You know, I'll never be, especially that fast going in a studio and having it all set up and everything works. That's yeah. not usually the way I work. How do you work, Rob? Like, what is your, like, what is your, uh, your modus operandi, so to speak, in the studio? Like, um, when you're going into a record a song, getting down? Um, if I'm recording, um, I, I essentially use the same analog path that I've been using for over 20 years. I, okay. I go through, some, I go through some uh, um, Rupert Neve designed Amec channel strips into an nice. old Uri 1178, which is a stereo 1176. This old compressor. Sometimes I don't compress a lot, but I just like the way it sounds going through the iron. Yeah, yeah before it gets uh, digitized. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I've got a few good mics that I've learned how to use. Mm. Um, and I'm set up so I can, I, I'm, I'm 30 minutes away from recording if I've got like an idea that must be recorded. Yeah. But I've, I've learned now that whatever I record might be, end up on the, end up being, be something that ends up on a final. So I try to not do demos. Yeah. Any, I try to make sure, ooh, I've got the, the levels right so I don't have to fix something uh, down the line. I will say that I noticed on uh, Shipshake that I, I'm i still more or less doing 16 track recording. I, I get uncomfortable when I'm getting much above 24 and certainly 32. I don't, I don't like looking at all those faders anymore. And I know that that's different yeah. from a lot of people. I agree. I think less is more in that area. For, yeah. for years, I, I only did eight track recordings down here, yeah. you know, and, uh, and that, now I have 16, but you know, I'm still, I, I like eight. It feels good. Yeah. Like it, it makes you get, say more or something, get it, get it done in less, less tracks. Yeah, I, I start going crazy when I've got a, you know, a mic on the top of the snare and the bottom of the snare. And yeah, I agree. And I, I like four or five drum, drum mics and that's it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Or, or one or two. Yeah, or, or one. Absolutely. 
yeah, I was I was aiming at that, but I didn't want to sound too hip. <laughs> but you're so hip. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so are are we? We're getting close to the end times. Can we do this again? I, I would love to. I I just oh my um we we've, we've been at this for a while. Well, I think we got into the zone. You know, is yeah. what happened. So Tim, how can we support you? How can how can um people that haven't heard Tim Motz or get a taste of Tim Motz or real fast and 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 get on board like me? <laughs> like uh, I have. You, I have a website, timmotzer.com. Uh, like that. Okay. God, we got to talk. It's kind of it's 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 fun. It's uh, it's a weird exhibition. <laughs> it's weird but so great to talk to you and to hang out. And yeah. we, we, we have got to hang out in a while. And yeah. uh, it's like kind of catching up with what we're doing and letting other people know too. And maybe there's some good stuff in there for other folks to take with them, you know, like yeah. our music. <laughs> like our Because I, I really um, do believe that our, our music really helps people. And your music has been helping me for years and years, all the way back to the 80s when I first heard you play. And, you know, your guitar playing blew me out and your songwriting and the raisins at that time. Uh, it was kind of helped me, help me uh, get on my path, so to speak. You know, and it's like, this is how you do a band. And, you know, and you guys were like, the greatest band in the world at that time, in my opinion. <laughs> you know? So it was quite mind blowing to to, um, to be able to be a witness to that. So many that lived in Ohio and got to get down and see you play. So I thank you for that always, definitely. Well, thank you. Um, you've you've returned the favor because I you know I'm just thinking about listening to you. You know, you sent me home last trip with just a bunch of CDs. You know, and I started just playing them. And then mm. I, I wouldn't even play this, I'd play it again, you know, I'd put in the next one. And then uh, it, I, I remember um, it was the last one. Uh, it was the one with um, uh, Barry's playing bass. And you told me you recorded this album in like a oh, day. Orion Tango. Uh, what, the white. Uh, Orion Tango. Yes. Or, Orion Tango. And that was just like a big wow. <laughs> That's that, it. Was it this? Yeah. 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 That one. Uh, yeah. That one's still in my car. <laughs> that one's just, let's 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 hang up and say thank you and good night. Okay. <laughs>